Okay, so this is just gonna be a short video to walk you through how the diesel heater control system works. All of our vans come standard with an Autotherm uh, Airtronic diesel heater. Uh, we do have the upgrade for um, the S-Bar heater, but that will be covered in a different video. Um, so the controls for this are just above the passenger seat. Um, this is just a standard thermostat like you'd have at home, and it's touch screen. So to change the temperature here, you would just move with your finger to select your desired temperature. To turn the heater on, you just tap the center auto term icon one time and you'll get this little wavy icon and the heater will wake up and start blowing air. It does take uh, five minutes or so to actually start to heat up. Um, the, the, the diesel pumps from the main diesel tank um, and there's a little glow plug in there that has to heat up and, and uh, start the flame. So it does take a second. Once it's up to temperature, you can adjust um, your temperature as needed. You can also uh, turn it off by just hitting the same button that you hit to turn it on in the center. Um, and that's going to wind down in a matter of another five minutes or so to cool off. Um, there are some settings that are handy to understand in the, the main menu here. So just the little tool icon gets you to the main menu. Um, you can change where the temperature is sourced for the thermostat. Right now it's set to external sensor, which is a, a little thermostat sensor that's above the headliner. If you find that that's not working very accurately for you, you can change it to panel sensor, where it's sourcing the temperature from the, the panel here itself. Or the power mode actually turns the screen um, into rather than a thermostat, it's a, it's a power setting between one and 10. So it's, it's more of like a manual mode. Okay, so on, in this screen, you're gonna have your working time. We ship the van um, with the setting to unlimited. So this will just run forever. If you want to set a uh, safety so that the, the heater will shut off automatically after a certain amount of minutes or hours, you can do that by unselecting the unlimited and changing your days, hours, and minutes here. So right now set at 40 minutes. If you turn the heater on, it will automatically shut off in 40 minutes. That way if you go to sleep or something, uh, you can set it to turn off later in the night. The next screen is your Fahrenheit setting or Celsius setting. So we, we ship these uh, in Fahrenheit. If you want it in your degrees in Celsius, you can do that here. And then the 12 hour clock can either be 12 hours or 24 hours. Um, and then this is just your, your heater information. If for some reason the heater is malfunctioning, you're having issues with it, you can call AutoTerm directly. They have a great over the phone service line and this is where you would give them the information for what your heater is. And then you can change your language settings, screen brightness and uh, timeout for the, the backlight to turn off. Um, exit button is in the top left. The other setting that's handy to understand is the timer. So you can set various timers for the heater to run automatically. Say you get up for work at 8 a.m. every morning and you want to have the van preheated before you go to work. You can set that per day of the week here. So if I'm on Monday, I can turn this on at say six o'clock in the morning and that way it'll be nice and toasty by eight. Um, and then select timer on and that way this will turn on every Monday at 6 a.m. You can set three timers per day for seven days a week. Um, so you can get pretty specific in there um, and you exit in that same setting up there. To change the time, uh, you're just going to hold the time icon and that's going to set your date and time. So that's important if you're running those timers that your, your clock is accurate. If you have any problems with the heater, the best thing to do is just call AutoTerm directly. You can obviously email us or anybody in our sales department will help you. Um, but if it's an issue beyond um, some basic settings, we'll likely hand you off to AutoTerm. They're the experts. Hey guys, uh, today we're here talking about your VanCraft van's electrical system. We're going to go over how the system works in general and then we're going to move into some specifics about troubleshooting steps and just how the system operates. So VanCraft camper vans are built entirely around an off-grid uh, power system. The idea there is that you're not having to plug your van into a grid, literally, to use all of the appliances. Everything should work uh, whether you're at a campground or out in the middle of nowhere. Right? So our vans are built around a, a really good set of low draw appliances. So all of your appliances in the van are as low uh, power consumption as possible. Um, we also have a, an enormous house battery bank in comparison to traditional RVs. Uh, you're looking at um, a, a pretty large solar panel at 320 watts on the roof. And then also our, our engine to battery charger um, allows you to charge your house battery bank while you're driving down the road. So those systems 
combined allow you to stay off grid for much longer um, and it allows you to kind of explore without having to be tethered to you know a reservation at a campground or or being plugged in at a driveway somewhere or something like that you can get off the grid and stay off the grid for as long as you want okay so what are all the pieces to the puzzle? There, there's a big system here. There are five major components to the system that kind of make it all up. There's the solar panel, the solar controller, the battery bank, the engine alternator charger, and your inverter. So we're gonna go one by one and go through these things to kind of further explain what they all do and, and how they add to the system. We're gonna start with the solar panel. So your solar panel's on the roof. It's about yay big. It goes from the front of the van to about the middle of the van. We're in a long wheelbase van now, so it goes about halfway back. Um, you can stand on it. It's load-bearing. You can climb up there and watch a sunset. Um, you got to climb up there and scrape it off if it gets snow on it. You want it to be uncovered for it to be working. Don't worry about washing it. Um, it's not going to give you very much efficiency gain. In general, that's 320 watts of solar. You're going to see on a really sunny day about 18 amps of charge from that guy. So that lives on the ceiling and it goes down through into your utility box. The power does. Uh, your utility box is under the bed. And in that utility box, you're going to find your solar controller. So a separate part of the system. The solar controller is like the brain that takes all the power in from the solar and then it distributes it either to the battery bank or to your utilities in the van. Utilities being like your refrigerator and lights and so on. Okay, so next big piece to the puzzle is the battery bank. Now, if you have option to lithium bank from us, you have a lithium battery bank. Most folks are just going to have the AGM battery bank that comes standard in their van. So. It's a 400 amp hour or so battery bank that comes standard. Uh, the lithium bank is a little bit bigger than that. Um, and so what the battery bank does is it just gives you the opportunity to use all of your appliances in the van when the sun is not out and the engine is not running, right? So if there's no power entering the system, the power comes from the battery bank. Um, do you have a battery monitor screen in your van? It's gonna be located in the long van next to the laptop bin at the end of the bench. In the short van, it's actually on the wall right next to the horizontal bench in the back. So that screen is going to tell you the, the battery's health, uh, state of charge, how many amps are coming and going from the battery bank. It's a really useful screen to pay attention to if you're curious about how much power you're using. The battery bank is charged two different ways. One is from the solar panel and controller like we just talked about. The other is from the engine's alternator. So as you're driving the van or even just idling in place, the engine is running, turning the engine's alternator and sending power back to your battery bank in the rear just like it does to the starter battery in your van. So that brings us to the last, or second to last, sorry, piece of the puzzle, which is the engine's alternator charger relay. And I say that all as a mouthful because there's a relay actually that controls all this. It's underneath the driver's seat, and it's kind of the gatekeeper from power at the, the starter battery to send power back to the solar battery. Okay, so last piece to the puzzle to talk about is the inverter. Now the inverter is a little separate from everything else, but it's worth talking about, pretty big item. The inverter uh, inverts power from 12 volt to 115 volt. And why that's important is most of the appliances in the van are running on 12 volt because it's energy efficient. If you do have something from home that you want to plug in, just like you would at home, we have an inverter for you to do that. It's a 3000 watt Renogy inverter. That's a standard uh, wattage size. That is going to power the plug outlet on the passenger side of the van. It looks just like one that you'd have at home, right? It's a, a regular outlet. You've got to have the Ren the Renogy switch turned on for that. So it's a Renogy brand inverter is what we use, and the switch is labeled as such right next to that outlet. It says Renogy. There's an off and on switch with a little indicator light. Just make sure that's on for the inverter to turn on. The second thing that inverter powers is the stove. If you have an induction cook stove in your van, which is also a standard feature, um, that's going to turn on and off with the inverter switch. So just make sure if you want to cook something that your inverter is first turned on. Lastly, while you're using the inverter, you want to monitor the battery consumption um, from the, the battery screen. So that, um, you know, that, that stove, for instance, uses a considerable amount of power. You want to monitor how much power you're using as you use that. If you plug something into the outlet that's connected to the inverter, um, you know, who knows what you're plugging in there, hair dryer, whatever it is, that could be using a lot of power as well. So it's a good opportunity to maintain that battery, take a peek at it. If you're starting to run, run low on battery, you can fire up the engine or uh, wait for the battery to trickle charge with the solar controller. Okay, so the whole system has all these pieces. How do I charge the battery, right? That's the biggest thing people ask. You can charge the battery by turning the engine on or just waiting. Um, the, the sun powers the solar panel and goes through the solar controller and charges the battery all day long so long as there's sun at about 10 to 18 amps. 
when you're running the engine and driving, you're charging at, geez, near 100 amps at sometimes. So, you know, driving the van is going to charge your battery bank a lot faster. Um, the, the van while driving will charge your battery bank from dead in about four, four and a half hours. So if you're on a, a bit of a drive every day, that's going to um, beef your battery level up. Um, if you're not from dead, it's pretty rare that you're going from dead. Um, and then just passively all day long, the, the, pow the panel is going to be shoveling power into your solar system as well. Now, if these systems don't work, right, wh what do I do? The next step is uh, troubleshooting. We're going to talk about um, what steps to go through to, to figure out why your systems aren't working. Often it's very easy to figure out. It's rare that there's actually something broken. So troubleshooting uh, steps for your van. If you have uh, you know, a no power condition, say the lights aren't working and nothing else seems to work in the van, the water pump won't turn on, you're not getting water, um, the, the USB outlets don't work, so on and so forth, what's the first thing that you do to troubleshoot that? So the first step that you wanna, wanna take is make sure that your solar controller is actually outputting power to all those devices. Um, at the solar controller itself, you can A, download the Renogy app to monitor your solar controller from your phone, or B, you can use the controls right on the face of the solar controller to turn those systems on and off. So to turn the system on and off for output to all your utility, it's the right key on the face of the Renogy uh, solar controller. So just hit that right key one time, that should shut the system off or back on again if it was already off. Hit it a second time to turn the system on. I like to leave my light switch on while I'm down there, so if I hit that button and it works, I know that I'm all good to go. If not, I have to move on to the next uh, next step for or figuring out what's going on wrong with the van. So second step in um, troubleshooting is gonna be your breaker switches. So there, there's three main breaker switches in this van. If you have an air conditioner, you're gonna have a fourth uh, breaker switch in the long van that's located under the sink in the short van that's going to be located beyond the drawers in the kitchen base cabinet <clears throat> those three or four breakers are a breaker for the battery to battery relay charge you're gonna have a breaker for the solar controller itself you're gonna have a battery for the inverter and then you're gonna have a battery for the air conditioner if you have an optional air conditioner you want to make sure that those are on. If they're flipped off, it means you've tripped the breaker for some reason and you're going to want to look into why that is. If it's on, you might try flipping it off and back on again to try and reset the system. Last thing is if you have a specific item that is not working, but everything else seems to work. Say the lights don't turn on, but everything else is working. My stove turns on, the faucet's working no problem, my USB chargers are working. Then that seems like it's more of a local issue to the lights itself. Now each system in the van is fused separately at the solar controller in the utility bay. So you can uh, actually pull the fuse to that item, inspect the fuse and replace it. There'll be a little baggie of spare fuses in your utility bay for you to replace that fuse if it does blow. If you have a problem beyond that, it's time to get in, in touch with customer service. Um, we're available 24-7 via email. You can also shoot us a call from 8 to 5 on weekdays, um, and we get back to emails and calls real quick. So hey, we're just going over the uh, induction cook stove in the vans today. I just want to do a quick video to kind of run you through how to use this efficiently. Um, we've had a lot of customers request that we use induction cook stoves over the years. We finally made that transition. Um, we no longer offer the propane stove. Um, the reason for that is that the battery technology is caught up and it's just easy enough to put this in the vans so long as you know how to use it. Um, so that's what this video is about. Um, the first thing you got to do to use the induction cook stove is turn the inverter on. So the inverter switch in this short van is right over by your overhead light switch. It's re labeled Renogy. It's a Renogy brand inverter. Um, so just turn that on. Pretty self-explanatory. It's going to beep to let you know that it's on. And then the stove is going to beep to let you know that it has power. So now that that's on, we can start the stove and, and get that running. Um, this stove is a single burner stove. That's all we use from True Induction. Um, it has a couple different settings. The first thing you want to do is make sure that you have an induction compliant pan. So this guy is magnetic. That's kind of you know what makes it compatible with an induction stove. So I actually carry a magnet in the store and check the pans. They'll say sometimes that they're induction compliant and they don't work. So just keep a magnet with you and test it that way. Also, the pan has to be a minimum of four inches with this particular cook stove so that the base diameter is four inches or larger. This one's, I think, six, so I know that we're good to go there. I've just put a little water in the pan to test it and show you how to use it. Um, we're gonna set that on the stove. 
Okay, so the first thing to do is actually turn turn the thing on, right? The on button turns us on. You have two different options here. We can go by heat or temperature, and that's just gonna give you two options for how you're selecting heat. Um, we're gonna go with temperature, and that's just gonna tell you here what the target temperature is for the induction cook stove. The lowest temperature is 150, and the highest temperature is 450. I always tell folks, you don't need to run this thing at high. Not only is it going to consume a tremendous amount of electricity, but it's just overkill for what you're doing. Um, it gets extraordinarily hot. 450 degrees is just very, very hot. You're going to burn your food. On medium, 300 degrees, this will boil in a matter of a minute or two. It takes no time at all. Just as a reference, now that this is running, we can show you on the battery screen exactly how many amps we're pulling right now to, to service this boiling. So right now you can see on the screen we're at a deficiency of 42 amps. Now the lights are on, the fridge is running, so you know take that out of consideration. We're, we're high 30 amps to run at 300 uh, degrees on the stove. It's a lot of amperage. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know you have a big beautiful battery bank in these vans. This one happens to have our lithium option, so I'm not too worried about it. But if I was cooking the meal for six people with multiple courses, I'd probably have a portable camp stove that I'd have outside on the, on the uh, picnic table. The induction cook stove is great for boiling water, making pasta or coffee, something simple in the morning. Um, but don't depend on it to feed a family of six or something. Just make sure you have a backup source of cooking. Um, so, you know, we'll run some tests on this later on and post on our Instagram maybe the power consumption of this thing over time, cooking certain meals. There's some great information out there that kind of illustrates that a little bit better. Um, but just for now, you can see, you know, at 42 amps, it's quite a bit of pull. Okay, so this is just going to be a quick video to show you how to connect your phone to Bluetooth on your radio. If you've had an aftermarket radio installed in your Sprinter from Vancraft Camper Vans, it comes with a Pioneer touchscreen head deck like this one here. And they all use the same Bluetooth system to do their connection, so I'll just go through that really quickly. The first thing you're going to want to do is go to your phone's Bluetooth settings. On an iPhone, it's real easy. Um, so. If you're anything like me, you have a lot of Bluetooth connections saved in your phone, so it's going to be very difficult to figure out which one of these you want to click on to connect to the radio. So thankfully, Pioneer has a system for that. You'll just go to your settings screen, Bluetooth in the bottom left, and connection at the top. And up here, you're just going to want to hit the search icon right here, and this is going to bring up your phone. So the second that you see your phone pop up, mine's just going to say iPhone, I can press cancel. I no, need, no longer need to be searching for a phone, and I'll just select my phone. Um, it's going to send a pin code to your phone to authorize that it's the right phone. So you'll hit pair on your phone, and then you'll hit pair on the screen as well. And now you're paired. Your iPhone or Android phone will ask if you'd like to sync your contacts list with the radio. I always do that. It makes it a little easier to make phone calls from the radio later. Um, now that I'm connected, it's going to load my contacts in here in the phone book. If I press the home button in the center of the, the bottom here, it's going to get me to my home screen. And from here, I can select uh, what audio input I want to use or if I want to use some of the built-in apps that my phone might also have. So right now, I'm just going to use the Bluetooth setting. Um, and that way, anything that I play for audio through my phone will end up playing through that Bluetooth setting. So if I open Spotify or something, I'll get sound coming through immediately. And if I pause that so you can hear me. Um, so that's how that works. You can use the Spotify app if you'd like. It brings up some more specific um, connections to your Spotify app on your phone. Um, but it's largely the same functionality. Um, the, the radios do all have uh, Apple CarPlay, but you'll need to plug your phone in via the USB plug in order to get the CarPlay to work. Um, in most of the new vans, that's located in the back top here. That's where you're gonna plug in. In this van, it happens to be like down low back here, but when you take delivery of the van, they'll show you where that plug is. But just understand that you'll need to be plugged in, hardwired in order for that car play to work. And in that case, your phone screen would be mirrored on the actual radio itself. So hopefully that helps. If you have any trouble getting your phone connected to Bluetooth, you can always give us a call or shoot us an email. Um, or you can just refer to your Pioneer manual um, to just retract those same steps. Hopefully that was helpful. Here we're going to show you how to use the hot water heater in our newest model van. So all of our new vans come with this Boss water heater. It's an inline propane powered water heater. This is a little accessory that we add on to the van for you so you have hot water in your shower system. Um, you can use the shower cold. You've got your, your shower uh, head here with the hose. And this just quick connects to the port in the bottom of your utility box here. 
So you just plug this in, pop, and then you've got cold water. Now if you want hot water, you're gonna use this Boss hot water heater in line with that. So I can disconnect this very easily, and all these use the same fittings. So I've got my hot water heater here. This is comprised of a water in and water out connection. It's got two D batteries on the bottom for the igniter, and then in the back, it's got your propane source. So we're just using these green Coleman cans. Um, it's the one pound propane low pressure cylinder. You can find them at any gas station or Walmart or wherever you'd like. Um, to hook this up, you've got an inline hose. You wanna make sure that your water pump is in the off position. So these switches are both pointing down. I'm gonna connect this hose and then the same connection is gonna go into the back of my water heater here into the water inlet port. And then I've got the water outlet port on the front, like that there. Okay, so now that we're all hooked up, we can turn the water pressure on with our, our water pump switch. We're gonna get water coming out right away. The water gets hot relatively quickly as well. To get hotter water, you use your knob here to lessen the amount of water flow. So the less water flow, the hotter the heat. Okay. I'm gonna turn this off. When I'm done here, I wanna shake all this water out. I'm gonna open up my cabinet here and I'm gonna turn the winterizer valve on. And then I'm gonna run this pump again and dry the system out. I'm gonna pump all the water out of these lines so that water is not coming out any longer. Okay, so when water starts coming out, you can then disconnect your lines. I'm gonna shut the water pump off. I'm gonna turn my valve off. The reason that you wanna do that is if you just disconnect it right away, all these lines are full of water and they'll just splash water everywhere. So you wanna dry these lines out with that winterizer valve. And then I can just coil these up and put them away. All right, so there's a couple things on the face of this that we're gonna go over too, just to give you a better idea of how to control the temperature on here and get it running. So on the top, there's a dial for temperature adjustment. You wanna keep this on max all the time. We've got a lot of water flow through here and you want a good hot shower. So I keep this on max and I do my temperature adjustment with the knob on the actual shower handle. And then there's power on and off. So that's gonna be just to turn the igniter on and off for the shower heater. It's also important to understand that when you're not using this, you want to disconnect the propane. The last thing that you want to have is this rattling around in the back of the van and have the propane come loose and leak while you're driving. So I just keep this disconnected when I'm not using it and I store it right underneath the shower controls in there. And this thing's safe for transport. So let's start with how do I winterize the shower in the van to prevent it from freezing? We've got 20 gallons of fresh water up here. We've got some plumbing fixtures inside this box. And you also have your shower hot water heater that's separate uh, from all that as well. So we wanna make sure that, you know, if you're in sub-freezing temperatures, none of those items are subject to freezing. And the best way to do that is to rid the whole system of water completely. So to do that, I'm just going to hook up my shower head. And I'm gonna actually disconnect the shower head from the hose altogether so it has as best flow as possible. And I'm gonna just put this on the ground. And then I'm just gonna turn on the water pump. And I'm going to run this pump until the tank is completely dry. Um, and that way there's no water in the tank, no water in any of the plumbing fixtures. And then I'm gonna leave this hose open while the van is being stored, inside the van, of course. Um, if you want to temporarily winterize this, say you're going someplace uh, for the day and you don't want to get rid of all this water in the van because you might need to use it tomorrow. But for the day, you're in sub-freezing temperatures and you're a little nervous you might freeze some stuff up. What you can do there is you can uh, isolate the water tank with this um, winterizing valve here. So this winterizer valve, when it's pressed in the upwards position, is going to shut the connection to the water tank off. And now when I run my pump with this hose, I'm going to run just the water from the immediate systems outside of the tank until there's no more water in that system. 
again, I'm gonna leave this open so that it has room for air to expand while the temperatures drop. But the 20 gallons that are in that tank, it takes a lot to freeze those. If you're gonna store the van for a long period of time in cold temperatures, I would absolutely recommend draining the water tank. But if it's just a quick overnight or a quick weekend trip to go skiing, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just make sure to winterize the plumbing fixtures in here, utilizing this winterizer valve. All right, go ahead. Okay, so now we're up at the sink area. We're gonna talk about how to winterize this sink. Now, same thing with the shower. You can do a deep winterize on this, or you can just do a temporary stop in case you're going to a cold climate for the night or a couple of days. Now, if you're gonna go and store this for a long period of time in cold temperatures, non-climate controlled area, um, you're gonna to wanna to rid the whole system of water altogether, and that's super easy. You're just gonna disconnect your water tank like you would to refill it, unbuckle this strap, pull the tank out, dump the water out, okay? And then when you're done with that, you're gonna turn on your faucet and your water pump, and you're just gonna run the sink dry, right? So I would just run that until the sink is just spitting water, and then I would leave the faucet open. If you don't wanna get rid of all the water on the tank, that's fine, you don't really have to, but what you do need to do is make sure that there's no water from this line to the end of the faucet. And so to do that, I'm just going to disconnect the top of the, the faucet connection here. Just like I would if I was gonna remove the tank to refill it. But in this instance, I'm actually just gonna leave the tank in here. This five gallons of water, it's likely not gonna freeze overnight in cold temperatures. Uh, maybe in like three or four days if it's extremely cold, but if you're camping in the van, remember that the heat's gonna be on anyway. Um, what you wanna do is make sure that this pump doesn't freeze for any reason. So we're just gonna disconnect this and we're gonna run the pump until it's dry again. Okay, that's good. And then this way there's no water from here to the end of the, the faucet. Now I'm also leaving this faucet open. If you're in really extreme temperatures, I have seen in the past that the aerator on top of the faucet will actually collect a little bit, maybe a half a tablespoon of water um, that's kind of just dripping here like this. Now it'll actually freeze overnight. We have some customers up in Montana, negative 20 degrees or so, and this froze up while it was stored overnight. So what you can do is just spin this faucet end and the aerator will come right out. So I would recommend this if you're in really, really, really cold temperatures. This just pulls right out here and you can set it over here. Um, and then, you know, when you come back to the van and it's heated again, you can put it back in. It just pops in there and then this cap screws on. But the key is you want to rid the system of water. And if you're in a short period of time, just remember that this, this big tank here probably won't freeze in that short period of time. And if it does, you'll just have to wait for it to thaw out but the pumps will freeze and break. So that's important that we get those cleared of water. All right, so now we're gonna talk about long-term storage. You're also gonna to wanna to do a couple of things to isolate the battery in the van so that it doesn't deplete over time. Now, what's cool about the way that we set our vans up is that you can shut the utility off from the solar controller, but still maintain your connection to the battery. So if you're storing the van outside for a long period of time, the sun will actually still maintain the battery bank while not putting power out to all your utilities, like the refrigerator and so forth. So to do that, you just turn this big master battery switch off. Any direction other than up is gonna turn the switch off. And now what's gonna happen is the solar controller is still working, but none of your lights, heater, shower pump, sink pump, garage light, the USB plugs, and so on and so forth, those items won't possibly pull power from the battery. So there's no draw on the battery. There's just input from the sun. Now, if you're storing the van, outside or sorry inside if you're storing the van inside you're going to want to um, disconnect the battery from everything altogether, solar included and shut everything down so we'll show you how to do that separately okay so if you're going to store your van for a long period of time indoors and you have no sun on the solar panel it's best that you just shut the whole system off completely so to do that um, i've removed the drawers in the kitchen. Now in the long wheelbase van, you won't have to do that. Imagine we're working under the sink in the long wheelbase van. If you're in a short wheelbase van, you're gonna pull the bottom two drawers out. To do that, the bottom of the drawers use these bloom drawer slide connectors and you're just gonna pinch like this and the drawer will pop right out. So pinch and hold and pull the drawer out and then we'll just set those aside. 
Now underneath inside of this bay, there's a couple things going on. Back in the back is our uh, sound system. You don't need to worry about that. In the top here, this is the refrigerator settings. You don't need to worry about that. What we're focused on is the breaker switches that are down low under here, kind of hidden. Now these are all labeled, okay? So all of these are connections between uh, the starter battery and the solar battery bank, the inverter, the battery to solar charger, the air conditioner. All we're worried about right now is finding the solar controller. It's gonna be a 40 amp breaker, and we're gonna just turn that off by flipping upwards. Now what that does is it disconnects the battery supply to the solar controller. So the solar controller is no longer drawing power or inputting power to the battery bank. The next thing we wanna turn off is the connection between the engine's alternator and the battery here. And that's just labeled charge relay. So we're gonna turn that off. And what that will do is prevent the starter battery and the solar battery from drawing off each other. Now, the other systems no longer have power supplied to them at all. Um, so we don't need to worry about turning those off. To be extra safe, I am just gonna shut them all off. That way, if you maybe accidentally switch the wrong breaker, you know that they're all off, it's easy to understand. Um, and so now none of the power leaving the battery box, which is under here, um, is going to be able to draw from the battery. It's all shut off. Okay, so there's one last thing to do. You gotta remember now that everything is turned off in the van. I mean, pretend that the lights are off. There's no power in here any longer. Now the refrigerator, like your refrigerator at home, if you turn it off and leave it sitting, it's gonna stink. There's gonna be mildew that builds up. It's gonna get nasty. So the refrigerator is turned off just like everything else in the van. I'm just gonna leave it open. It's important because this moisture and so forth in here is just gonna get moldy and gross if you're storing the van for a long time. Leave that open. Everything else is probably fine. Uh, some people put like mothballs and things to keep rodents away. It really depends on where you're storing the van. I'm just assuming that you're storing it in a temperature con controlled climate inside a building somewhere. Um, if it's outside, certainly do something to prevent uh, rodents from getting in the van or chewing on wires underneath the van. But that should be everything you have to do.